the Barnyard Language. We are Katie and Arlene, an Iowa sheep farmer and an Ontario dairy farmer with six kids, two husbands, and a whole lot of chaos between us. So kick off your boots, reheat your coffee, and join us for some Barnyard Language, honest talk about running farms and raising families. In case your kids haven't already learned all the swears from being in the barn, it might be a good idea to put on some headphones or turn down the volume. While many of our guests are professionals, they aren't your professionals. If you need personalized advice, consult your people. We are back for our final episode of season two. Katie, can you believe it? I cannot, Arlene. It seems like just yesterday that I was waiting with bated breath to see if you would give in and agree to to do this show with me, Arlene. And as always, I am incredibly grateful that you did because A, there wouldn't have been an episode one, let alone a season two, if it had been up to me to do it. And B, two... I, d- I don't know if I started with A or with one. Yeah, <laughs> numbers, whatever. This is why I needed a co-host, guys. Uh, nobody would have wanted to listen to it if it had just been me. Because A, it would have been terrible and disorganized. And B, we would not have gotten all the great conversations that we've had. So Well, I have always I appreciated that. from the very beginning that you asked me to join. And I'm glad that I said yes. And same, same for A, B, and one and two, because it definitely wouldn't have happened with just my skills either. So it's amazing how our two skill sets, considering we only met each other once in person and only really ever talked online, that our skill sets really combined so well and have turned into something that we enjoy and we hope that you do too. So before we go on summer vacation, Katie, what's happening on the farm? What's new with the kids? What's the news from Iowa? I feel like I should be yelling something like, teamwork makes the dream work, Arlene. <laughs> yeah. Or not. Um, we're still a lot cooler than the rest of the country, but it is hotter than hell here this week. It's supposed to be over 90 every day for like 12 days or something stupid. Um, and in Iowa, that means also like 300% humidity. Upside, the corn likes it. Uh, nobody else does. So that's a bit of a downer. Um, other than that, the kids are kind of getting ready to go back to school. Um, the girl child has been referred back to speech therapy starting again this fall, I guess. Um, what? Oh my God. Once again, if anybody can figure out why Spotify keeps auto playing, um, <laughs> about two minutes into our intros, that'd be great. Because, yeah, it was just playing a little C&C Music Factory because I've been pumping up the jams for the kids in the morning. Um, Yeah, so the girl child's going back to speech therapy. We went to the dentist last week for their preschool checkups, and I tried to convince the dentist that we should get a discount because neither of my kids has a mouthful of teeth. Um, They're growing like weeds. It's about time to buy new school clothes. Uh, My daughter bought a toy called a Magic Mixie. Don't buy this thing for your kids. It's evil. What is it? It's like a Furby that comes in a glass ball with a magic wand. Yikes. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty sure it's possessed. Uh, One of the boy child's toys has started randomly making engine noises and backup beeping noises in the middle of the night. And there is an animal somewhere in my house making an unidentifiable noise. I don't think it is a baby bat, but I don't know what it is. And your Spotify just starts randomly, too. So all the noise are happening. Noises are happening all the time. And also, my son learned from one of his little friends to ask Alexa to play things. No, Alexa, I'm not actually talking to you. Um, Anyway... He keeps requesting that she who shall not be named. I can't hear it from my uh, end, but obviously you can. Well, can't. that's good because it was playing Everybody Dance Now again. Oh, um, perfect. That, that's the song. Yes, yes. Um, he has learned to ask her to play things, but he still has too much of a baby voice for her to understand him. So he yells at her until she randomly plays stuff. Right. And it's mostly Not been what about, he wants. yeah it was yesterday it was like 20 minutes of which animals fart 
which was not what he was asking for, but he thought it was hilarious, so then we all had to listen to it. Um, other than that, not a whole hell of a lot. Um, <laughs> it's quite the update. Raccoon killing. That's that's the farm up update. I've been killing raccoons. Um, yeah, they're going after I will fowl. say, yeah, I, I don't really believe in killing anything I don't intend to eat. It is not the way I was raised. Um, but also, I don't really appreciate having my birds killed, and especially in the way that animals like raccoons tend to do it. It does not tend to be a fast and humane situation. So, um, that's that. That's What's that. been happening at your place, Arlene? Well, I had a birthday, so that was... Yay. You know, as an, yay, as an adult, it's both like something you kind of look forward to and it feels a bit anticlimactic. But anyway, it was fine. There was a birthday. I got presents. It was great. And I got to go away on the weekend. A friend of mine from university days, she's in Australia. So a friend that I actually went to visit a few years ago for my 40th birthday. She was back in Canada with her husband and family to visit her parents and extended family so her home is about mm, a five hour drive from here so another friend and I went to visit her there since she had already made the trek halfway around the world we you know could travel within the province so we went to see her just the two of us so that was super relaxing because we got to just hang out as grown-ups and not look after anyone else's food needs. As three moms getting together, we spent an inordinate amount of time talking about all the things that our kids will and won't eat and how annoying it is to be constantly preparing food for little people who will and won't eat what you prepare. So at least we know that's a universal problem. And farm-wise, like I said, my daughter is uh, away for a little while at a cow show. And my husband is making a couple of trips there this week, both drop off a heifer, attend a judging conference, and then to watch the show. So of course those events are spread out by a couple of days. So he thought about spending most of the week there, but then thought better of it. And he, he is gonna make a few trips back and forth. So he's spending a lot of time driving. I'm at home with the boys and milking cows and looking after stuff here. So not a lot of excitement, it's hot. It's stormy some of the time. We're still spending a lot of time swimming. I find that with older kids, when they were younger, I was trying to fill the days. Not that I'm not now, but you know, when they were little, I was going to a lot of playgrounds and play groups, going to library programs, all of that kind of stuff. And it was kind of like, get everybody out of the house so we can tire them out, then maybe they'll have a nap, all that kind of stuff. And now, it's not as much like that and they all have chores to do so it's making sure that we're even if we do go somewhere making sure that we're back in time for them to do their chores and for me to do mine and so it's just a different flow I'm not saying it's better or worse but just different and I'm still kind of adjusting to that so yeah summer and while Katie's talking about back to school we are not even at the halfway point yet so I cannot even think yet about the fact that school will be happening because there's still so much summer left to go. We actually still have about another month until school starts back, but the girl child is going to two weeks of summer school, which starts on Monday. Um, sure. So that gets us pretty much to when school starts. Yeah, which that is, pretty much. Pretty much I'm is. very grateful that my kids are still young enough that they're excited to go to school. The boy child isn't, but he will be once he starts back, um, mm -hmm. hopefully. But yeah, it's it's going fast. Yeah. So the next five weeks after this week, we're going to be doing reruns. So if you haven't heard them before, lucky you. You get to uh, catch some of our favorites. Not that we have favorites. They're like children, right? We love all of them. I episodes. have favorites. Okay, we have some favorites, and these are some classics that we're going back to. So the next five Thursdays after this week are going to be repeats. And um, the episode this week, we're talking to someone about rural child care. And she sent an update a little while ago about the fact that child care has actually made it into this year's farm bill. So 
as a Canadian, I don't exactly know what that means. But Katie, maybe you can tell people what they need to do about that. Is that something that you can lobby about? Should you people go and find that section and read it? What do you need to know about that? Ideally, you would read the whole thing, but I have the feeling that it's probably a couple thousand pages. Um, I think even among American farmers, it is not often known how many things fall under the farm bill, like rural child care that seems like it would be under some department other than the Department of Ag. But nonetheless, yes, anyone you can lobby, um, even just being on the board of our local daycare and realizing how few even community members, let alone politicians, have any idea about the issues facing rural child care centers and rural parents. Um, lobby anyone you can. Just random strangers in the street. Stop them and yeah. tell them a few factoids. Yeah. Have you, you know, heard about as, child as, care? As, as parents, plenty of people have stopped us to give us random thoughts on how we're living our lives. So I think it's really time that we go ahead and sure. stop other people to give us, give them their, our thoughts on children. There you go. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll go ahead and listen to our interview with Florence because she has a lot to say about rural child care and it was a really interesting chat. So here she is. Today we are talking to Florence Bicut, who is joining us from central Wisconsin, and she's a rural sociologist, I'm not going to say psychologist, rural sociologist and researcher at the National Farm Medicine Center. So Florence, we start each of our interviews with the same question, and this is a way to introduce yourself to our listeners. So we always ask, what are you growing? So for farming gifts, that covers crops and livestock, but can also use, include families, careers, businesses, and all kinds of other stuff. So Florence, what are you growing? Thanks, Erin. Um when there's no snow on the ground here in central Wisconsin, I do garden um, and I grow uh, vegetables. Uh, but as far as my day job, uh, I grow data as a researcher. Um, and the other thing, too, that I try to do with my research is to grow spaces for people's lived experiences to be shared more broadly and spaces for people to talk about solutions that could help address um, their, you know, whatever challenges they may be facing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What um, what vegetables are your favorites to grow? Um, I love to grow the kinds that uh, are easy to maintain. <laughs> potatoes Same. is a great one. Uh, until I moved to Wisconsin, I could not grow potatoes. For some reason, I didn't have right soil, and now they do wonderfully. Uh, I like to do tomatoes, and I love green beans, uh, and I grow the, the thin beans, French-style beans, that I have a hard time finding around. Um, and they are so easy to freeze as well and weed them through the year. So nothing fancy, really. Yeah, but delicious. And Florence, where did you grow up? I grew up in the northwest part of France, um, in Brittany. Um, you might, folks might have heard of Normandy um, as it pertains to World War II. And is your family involved in agriculture or is this a, a new frontier for you? It is now a new frontier for me. Uh, both of my parents grew up on farms. Um, and as far as I can tell, our entire family lineage up until to my parents was involved in agriculture. Um, the fun story too, kind of small town stories that my mom's dad worked on my, on the farm of my dad's parents. Sorry, that's getting complicated. My dad's parents had a largely larger farm that my mom's parents so my um, my maternal grandfather worked on um my fraternal grandparents sorry this is getting complicated and then uh, <laughs> that's all right so while my parents uh did not um take over the farm my uncle one of on both sides of my parents have had uncles who have uh, taken the farm um we still have the farmhouse and farmland um and um, yeah, and so growing up, spent my weekends, holidays on grandparents' farms, um, family dinners, which in France are usually hours long. Think about Thanksgiving on a regular basis. Um, we talked a lot about agriculture. Um, and the thing too that talked a lot about, I didn't realize until more recently, kind of wondering about why am I so interested in those topics, talked a lot about ag policy. I grew up at the time of, uh, USSR falling, 
Um, you know, I, I vividly remember when the, the Berlin Wall fell. And at that time, too, you have the whole development of the European Union uh, and the common agricultural policies with a lot of questions about what they were going to do to agriculture. And so there was a lot of angst around what are those common agricultural policies going to do to farmers. Um, and so my uncles could not stop talking about that. Uh, <laughs> and I remember us kids being like, oh, man, <laughs> we're so bored. <laughs> 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 yeah, this again. Yep. So in the region of France that you're from, what kinds of farms are we talking about in terms of sky size and what, what was produced on those farms? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's changed the way that it has in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, the Brittany, Brittany has a good year-round climate for vegetable. Um, so you have a fair amount of... Um, you know, the fresh veggies that you would find in, in grocery stores, right? A lot of cauliflowers, broccolis, I think not as much, um, potatoes as well. Um, and a lot of it too around the coastline, uh, very good soils. Um, a lot of um, dairy as well um, and uh, hog, hog farming. And hog farming get, became kind of bigger over time. Um, and I think that there are more pigs than uh, people in the region of Brittany. Um, as far as scale, you know, they're much smaller than they are in the U.S. and Canada. Um, I, I think, think of maybe about a, a traditional Wisconsin farm, the way that we tend to think about. Um, that'd be more of the kind of scale that you've had. But there has been a process of concentration and consolidation, right? As folks have retired, um, as there has been fewer farmers on the lands, but they've also been more efficient, you know, covering more land. Um, and in terms of the economy, I think that agriculture as well as food processing are, you know, it's been a long time since I looked, but are one of the leading industries in terms of dollars um, for this region of France. So very, very important to the region and a lot of pride in agriculture and its history. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're, where you're working now at the National Farm Medicine Center, both kind of what the center does and how, how you, as an individual, ended up there? Yeah, so the National Farm Medicine Center, um, you know, was started by physicians um, in the sense that the National Farm Medicine Center is based um, at the Marshfield Clinic Health System, um, which has been around, the Marshfield Clinic Health System has been around since the 1910s. And I think, um, I, I might get in trouble with my colleagues, but I think that the early research around farmers' lungs, starting in the 40s or the 50s, I think, um, that is when uh, ducks would see farmers coming in uh, with their lungs, um, you know, the, the consequences of like the of hay and bacteria, I think, or again, I'm gonna get in trouble. I need to read up on that. But essentially uh, the first research grant that was brought to Marshfield was uh, focused on the farm population, was to look at farmer's lung. Then over the years, there was research done to look at cancer in agriculture. Um, and then I think that the center was formally funded in the 1980s. And then in the 1990s, there started to be more focus on children in agriculture and exposures to risk of children. Um, Dr. Barb Lee um, has been around since the 1980s um, and she's, she's been instrumental in creating the first national centers um, to focus on the safety of, um, of children. And that center has been funded for over 25 years by CDC National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety. And so I, over the years, the National for Medicine Center and the Children's Center has gone, has gone from being a research center that was very grounded in, in health and medical research to over time having more diversity of research with engineering, uh, nursing, bioinformatics, anthropology, family studies, myself as a rural sociologist. The way that I ended up there, <laughs> it's a fun story. Um, I was working my dissertation. I was doing research um, on, on child care a little bit. Health insurance was more of my focus. And I remember I was... Um, you know, looking through what research has been done previously. And I find this report that looked at child care for migrant farm workers. Um, and I was like, who are these people? <laughs> and that report was from Marshfield. 
And so I started reading up on them and you know, it was my last year, I was gonna need a job and I was reading up on them and I'm like, these people are really interesting. I wonder if they're hiring. <laughs> they were hiring. <laughs> and, uh, and I've been there for over three years now. That's so interesting because I think we really forget how different some of the medical needs of farmers are just from things we're exposed to, but also childcare and engineering and that we were in a very different industry than a lot mm -hmm. of folks are. You know, there's not many industries where your whole family lives at your work. You know, it's not a common, a common thing. And it's definitely different. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we were reading a little about your research background. And one thing that really jumped out was the quote that her research first considers the ways in which difficulties meeting social needs such as health care, child care, or aging expand beyond the confines of the personal sphere and can have direct implications on the farm, including the adoption of farm safety practices and farm business development. Um, it sounds so much like what we talk about on the podcast, but normally we're looking at just the family. Um, can you expand on that and explain why moving beyond that personal sphere and into the community is so important? Yeah, into the business, into the community. Um, I think, you know, when we look at issues like childcare and health insurance, um, we, we tend to see them as household level issues, as personal issues, right? And we, we don't talk about it. Um, and, and I think too, in agriculture, it depends who you talk to. But we know that in agriculture, as you were saying, Katie, the, the family is oftentimes on the farm work site. They oftentimes leave, you know, the, 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 the farm, the house is oftentimes on the farm, where the farm business is. Not for everyone, right? But we also know that one of the big reasons why farms have been able to persist over time and to stay on the land, even though it's a very um, unproductive occupation, it's one, there is a lot of changes. Uh, one of the things that we know that help farms stay on the land is because they share resources between the household and the farm business, right? In terms of like people split their time, uh, people are able to, um, you know, work on the farm and not necessarily pay themselves. Uh, and the same too with the money, right? The, the money can be allocated to the household or the farm business, depending on, on how you look at it, right? When we started, um, you know, and I need to give a lot of credit to my colleague Shoshana Inwood at the Ohio State University, who really is the one that brought me into her research on these topics. Um, really what she started hearing when she was talking with farmers was how health insurance, and in particular the cost of health insurance, which Arlene, I'd be curious to hear about Canada, how it works. Um, in the US there, um, when she asked the question, what are the top barriers to your farm business? Um, they, she was doing a survey, I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. This was like 2006, 2007. She was doing a survey with colleagues. They were looking at uh, what enables farms to thrive and to stay on the land. Um, and she asked, can we please ask, add an option about cost of health insurance? So all they had was, you know, access to land, um, access to capital, uh, farming knowledge. And she had to... <laughs> argue with her colleagues or very strongly say, hey, can we please add the cost of health insurance? And they did. Um, lo and behold, that came up as the top two or top three challenge that farmers face. And so that what that kind of what started, um, you know, that line of research um, to, to really, you know, hearing, talking to farmers at the kitchen table about what some of their challenges were around those very household level issues um, and how they're impacting the business. And so fast forward, you know, 10, 15 years later, um, we've been, you know, we've been doing research together for the last eight years, I think, um, where really, when we ask farmers about, you know, what it's like to, you know, how, you know, sorry, I'm not being very clear here. Um, you know, kind of ask them, you know, what, when we talk about health insurance, we, we've heard over and over people saying it's too expensive or I need to have an off-farm job to pay for my health insurance or to be able to access health insurance. But what that means is it takes time away from my ability to work on the farm. Uh, we've heard people say I'm on purpose keeping my investment on the farm lower so that my farm income stays below 
a particular threshold so that I can be eligible for uh, Medicaid, you know, public insurance for the kids or for themselves. We also heard from farmers who say, I'm waiting until 60, I'm 65 to get some of that stuff done. And so really what we are hearing is the extent to which people's challenges with health insurance, childcare as well, um, have direct implications on the farm business. Um, and we know that farm businesses too um, are connected to the local economy. Um, and when we talk too about health insurance and childcare, and we talk about hiring folks, right, hiring farm workers, the, the ways in which people might not want to take a job if it doesn't offer health insurance. Um, and so it, it's kind of how all these things are connected, but that somehow in farm policies we haven't been talking about. It's almost like what belongs to the household, we just don't talk about it when we talk about farming. And our research really points to the fact that it's unfortunate. <laughs> Um, because it's, and, and I'd be curious to hear from you, Arlene and, and Katie, around how these things impact your farm, right? And, and how you have to navigate them and the kind of choices that you end up having to make. Yeah, I would say, I mean, as a as a Katie, this is a discussion that we've, Katie and I, on a personal level have had before. And and I don't know what the statistics are. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to know, but I, anecdotally, I can say that as someone who lives in a country with socialized medicine, I we are uninsured in terms of you know extra um, you know medical expenses, the things that someone, the type of, of medical benefits that someone would get with a, a full time job, you know, dental, eye coverage, those types of things. But we don't have to pay into a system um for our day-to-day -day expenses right i mean we can go to the doctor we could go to the emergency room any of those types of things we as a farm family don't have to worry about paying anything extra for those services they're covered for us so i i think you know on an anecdotal sense that it definitely is a huge impact for farm families because i i know a lot of families who have the opportunity like my husband and i where both members of the household both members of a, a partnership can work full time on the farm because that's not something that we that we have to to pay extra for it's mm -hmm. it's not something that we need that we need to consider or, or take into account and I, I think, Katie, on a, a personal level, that's one of the reasons that you and your husband do have off-farm jobs is that is that <laughs> the healthcare aspect is. Yeah, I mean, Jim now piece. has been able to take a job that doesn't offer healthcare, but only because my job offers very good healthcare. Um, we'd be totally screwed if you know if I lost that source of healthcare. And I know a lot of families who are in that position of if they make any more income than they lose any, um, you know, they can't afford to better their lives by getting better jobs or what have you, because the cost of the benefits that they're getting, like insurance, through the government is so much greater than the extra income that they would bring in. Or, you know, the, the cost of child care is so high that the extra income would not offset it. Um, I know I was a stay-at-home parent for the first three and a half years of our kids' lives because my income would not have covered child care, let alone anything else. You know, I mean, I would have been working entirely to not be raising my children. And yeah. that's, it's a, it's a whole thing. Yeah. So. And I often think about one farmer that we talked to a few years ago that was talking about kind of like the, the crazy gymnastics that, you know, you just talked about, Katie, right? And she said, like, the, the rational choice for my children, for my family, is the irrational choice for my business. And that's so interesting, right? Because we talk so much about we need to be rational and economic actors, and so much of the farm business trainings are about helping people being rational and make the best business decisions. But in reality, once you start incorporating the needs of the household, and I think it's, it's similar in other occupations, right? When we start incorporating what we need on our day to day, uh, folks cannot make those best rational economic decisions. 
And so also what we know and what we've looked at is what are some of the long-term consequences on the farm business, right? Because early in the years, right, usually when people start a business or take over a business, right, that's when they tend to start a family. That's when folks are most vulnerable in their adult years as young adults, right? They're just finishing school or they might have been done from school for a year, but they might meet a partner, they might get married, and then they might start having children. And it's at the time that where your financial assets, you have less of them, but there's also a lot of pressure because you want to grow your family. That has a cost. But you want to grow your business or you need to pay to pay financial assets of the older generations or you need to make sure you're paying enough into the farms so that the older generations has enough retirement, um, you know, e enough financial access to financial resources for whatever their, their needs might be in their later years, elder care or who knows, right? And, and it's what, what we've looked to in our research is how those long-term consequences on, on the trajectory of the farm business. And so when we have agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who has had a lot of initiatives to support beginning farmers, to recruit the next generation of farmers, but they don't talk about these really important things. And, and we've heard from farmers, too, who, who people have given up farming because they couldn't make it work for their families. And so it's almost like, are we... Are those investments not as effective as they could be because we're not talking about things that impacts the day-to-day -day of people's lives? So we're working yeah, on this, absolutely. Shoshana. <laughs> yeah, so and the ones... Do, right? Bring up those issues. Yeah, so the one study that I was reading of yours where it talked about childcare for farm families and, and so what's the title? A key strategy to keeping children safe yet largely absent from farm programming. So who did you talk to about that in that study? Because that's the kind of what you were already talking about is is that there's there are all these programs that are supposed to be talking to farmers and yet it's not talking about all the things that actually people yeah. <laughs> need to, to know about. <laughs> So this was part of a, a five-year project that is funded by CDC, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, through the Children's Center in Marshfield. The premise of that project was that for all these years, farm safety experts, farm research points to the fact that the more children are in the farm work site, the more they're exposed to risk. And so they point to the importance of, in particular, for the youngest children, right? The non, what we call the non-working bystanding children. We're thinking, we're talking babies, toddlers, you know. Um, the It's the importance of supervising them of the work site and that any kind of supervision by an adult, right? Or by, you know, a, a teenager, a responsible teenager, right? It's paid, unpaid, it's, it's at the house with grandma, it's a high school babysitter that comes over, it's child care center, it's school, but, but the idea is like if, if we, you know, the, the best way to protect children is by limiting their time in the farm works that in particular when folks are doing things that are dangerous, right? Like maybe there's a lot of tractor work that needs to be done in the barn uh, or, um, or around the barn. That might not be the good time to have children, right? But what we noticed is that as much as there's been recommendations, kind of tying back to what we were just saying, there's been virtually zero research on childcare for the farm population in the US, but in other countries. I have dug around in French, in English, those are the languages that I speak. No one's talking about it, so little. It talks about women in agriculture, but it talks about them as professionals. It doesn't talk very much about them or very little as caregivers. Um, and it doesn't really talk about what are people's lived realities? And so this project was about, well, let's look at this. Let's ask the question. Because the only thing too that I kept hearing, and it was either implicit or explicit, is that farm parents do not want to use childcare. But I kept thinking kind of similar, and, and I think the, the project on health insurance really put the big bug in my ear. Because we often say, oh, farmers, they're a tough crowd. They don't want to go to the doctor. But yet here we were talking to farmers who said, I'd go to the doctor if it wasn't so expensive. And so it was like, are, are, are we keep, is there some kind of like always this narrative that farmers don't want help or farmers don't want to go to the doctor, don't want to use childcare. But have we really asked people 
what they want to do. And so that's what this project is about. This study, Arlene, that you brought up was really kind of like to, to get a sense of what's the lay of the land. So before talking to farmers, we wanted to be what's out there in terms of resources for farmers if they were out and about looking for ideas on how they juggle um, children and farm work, if they were out looking for ideas on how do I think through having children while growing my farm business, right? And so what we did is two things. We did um, what's called environmental scan. Essentially, we went on the internet and we did keyword searches and we looked at what's out there for people who want information about children, childcare, and farming. Um, and then, and we looked through those documents and we looked at what are they talking about? And then we looked at the extent to which they're just like talking about it superficially or are they actually providing direct actionable recommendations, ideas, or are they not talking about it? And the other thing too that we did is we did interviews um, with what we call key informants. So those are folks who are in professional setup to work directly with farmers, right? So we've talked to folks from farm organizations, we talked to folks from Extension, we talked to folks from federal and state department of agriculture. And we essentially asked them, um, what, how do you integrate children and child care into your work? And we also asked them, um, what do you see farm parents do when it comes to navigating children and the farm? And so well, it was fascinating because on one hand, when I look at the documents, when I look at how our children talked about, child care is not really talked about. Children is talked about, but more from the perspective of farms are wonderful places to raise children. And you have a lot of smiling families. And I don't want to take that away from people. I think that this has been, um, you know, people really enjoy having the kids around. It's a source of enjoyment for many people. At the same time, what we found is that those documents um, and it could be, you know, a, an extension pamphlet. It could be the web pages of the farm organizations. They only show the, the, the shiny part. There is no part about, here's what happens when the kid's going to throw a tantrum. And here's what, you know, and here's, you know, um, you know, a, a toddler that has a lot of needs and is going to interrupt you every other minute, right? If not sooner. And when we talk to folks too, what we heard was, it was again fascinating was, what well, we don't really do any programming around it. And the reasons were like, you know, we don't hear about it. It's not our job. We haven't thought about it. Farmers don't complain about it. But then when we ask about, well, what do you see farm parents doing and, and how is childcare for them? They knew it was hard. That, that was like fascinating was so many of them. And a lot of them also were farmers or from a farm background would say like, yeah, it's really hard for the younger farmers. Like, I don't envy them or they talk about um, how, yeah, what well, I see the kids around a lot because there's not really childcare in the area. And so it was like, what we found was like that disconnect of like, we know there is a problem, but we don't talk about it. And then we don't really do anything about it. And so as researchers, what we do is we dug a little deeper and we're like, why aren't we doing anything about it? And so we dug deeper in the sense that we looked at, we thought about women historically in agriculture has been, have been invisible, right? Or kind of like farm women, maybe they do the farm work, but they're not necessarily seen as a farmer in their own right, right? They are like the farmer's wife. And we've also talked about how as a society, we don't always talk about um, child care or it's women's work but also how as a society we, rec we recognize some form of work as um, being forms of work that we pay for, that have a, a monetary value on it, and other forms of work like caregiving that doesn't have monetary value on it. So we kind of started thinking about why is it that we don't talk about this and is essentially is caregiving seen as women's work that they're, you know, we haven't, talked about it and we don't necessarily see it as a problem. And talking about it could actually be pushing back against what we see as the traditional family model of what it's like to have a farm. Sorry, that was a long explanation, Arlene. No, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And it's it's true. I mean, there's there's so much of that, you know, not seeing the value in childcare 
both, you know, as a society, it doesn't feel like we value childcare workers, but we also don't value the people who are, are doing it for no pay, which is mm -hmm. more often than not women. But, you know, even if you're only, I say only in quote marks, even if you're only looking after your own kids for no money, you are providing a good to society and a, and a good to your family, but there's, yeah, there's no economic value placed placed on that work and it is work we know how much work that is mm -hmm. yeah and and that part that you talked about about only seeing the shiny parts i mean exact that's exactly true too right we only want to talk about how good it is for kids to be raised on a farm and that's a huge piece of why we do this podcast is because we acknowledge that yes we also believe this is a wonderful place to raise kids but it's also as we all know a dangerous place to raise kids and a hard place mm -hmm. to raise kids and it's and you know there's there's so many risks and it you know their their presence on a work site because that's what a farm is is dangerous for them and distracting for adults and also dangerous for adults sometimes if you're distracted by your kids and yeah it's it's that cycle that nobody really wants to talk about i mean we do talk about farm safety for kids but yeah but incorporating that piece of childcare is one of the solutions and mm -hmm. I agree with you. We, we can't say that people don't want it because they're not accessing it. Because if, if it's not provided accessible and available, then <laughs> how can they access yeah. it? How can they use it? Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and people are using lots of informal care. Um, mm -hmm. but, but same thing, right? Grandma's maybe not getting paid or yeah, grandpa isn't, or yeah, they're, they're, they're going on a tractor maybe more than they and their parents would like, but that's, you know, the buddy seat for the, for those days is going to be the safest place, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not the most productive and it's maybe not the best for, for anyone, but it's the situation that, that they're in. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I hear it. And, and, you know, to me, like I, I, I think a lot about what happens here, right. In the context of, of, of other places that I know, right. And it's not to say that one is better than another. There is no perfect place, right? We can always think that grass is greener on the other side. There is always like patches of brown anywhere that we go, right? But I often reflect about, you know, I grew up in France. One thing that I didn't share too um, is that my mom was a childcare provider. For most of her career, she had um, a little um, home based center. She would get, she was accredited through the government for the quality certifications. In France, usually it's like three, three to four kids, and there and there is like strict restrictions around like if you have babies versus toddlers, right? Um, and you know, a lot of you know, I grew up in a rural area, town of three thousand people. We were you know nearby to a large metropolitan area, so you had a fair amount of people commuting, right? But over the years, I mean, she had children from farm families, um, and you know, and so that idea that farmers don't want to use childcare. I think too, once we started talking to farm parents and we started with farm women. So after we did that first phase of trying to see like, what's the landscape out there? What are, what is being said or not said about children in childcare and agriculture? Then we were like, all right, let, let's talk to farm parents. The first thing that we did was focus groups and photo voice activity with farm women. And we really debated around this one a lot. Do we include dads, moms, who do we talk to? We decided to start with women raising children in agriculture um, because we, we do know that as a society, women still play a primary role in raising children. And when you do focus groups, which are those group discussions, you want to make sure that people are going to feel comfortable and are not going to be alienated by too much difference. And we were worried that if we introduce, um, you know, that if we have moms and dads together, are there things that people are not going to feel comfortable saying? We started with mom, with with women, and it didn't have to be biological children. We also need to talk to the 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 men at some point because they also play a really important role that I think we underplay. The reality is, you know, there is always budget restrictions around what we do, right? But anyways, to speak to the extent that people want to talk about this, our goal was to talk to thirty women in uh, 30 women and we're like, you know, it's going to take us five weeks to find 30 women willing to talk to us. We were so wrong. <laughs> in five days, we had 108 women sign up and we're like, whoa, <laughs> we were, we're like, this is awesome. And like, we've clearly hit a nerve. 
Um, and so with Shoshana, my collaborator, we went back and we're like, all right, originally we were going to do these focus groups in person. We were going to travel. We're not doing that anymore because of COVID. So because part of the focus group was we were going to give a financial incentive. And so we want to make sure that we could give it to everyone and not just a few. Right. So we reshuffled things. So in the end, we talked to over 70, 70 women. Uh, over 13 focus groups. Um, they were principally from Ohio, uh, Vermont, and Wisconsin. Those are the states where we started our study. And um, I will tell you that almost every focus group, I was in tears at one point or another. Um, it was heavy. It was so heavy. Um, because I think that what women talked about was how much they love having their children around. But as you were saying, Katie and Arlene, it's also hard. It's nerve-wracking. And the first question that we would ask was, you know, it, it's a typical day in October. Um, from the moment that the children get up to the moment that they go to bed, where are they? What are they doing? Who is with them? And I will tell you that hearing women, over 70 of them, sharing that, uh, it's exhausting because the amount of gymnastics that people are having to do the amount of like, what, for two hours, they're with my mom. And then my dad comes over and then picks them up and brings them over them. I mean, somebody talks about like we're passing the baton. And so when we think about quality, what is quality child care, right? Or what's quality supervision? Yeah, maybe they're on the farm with their families, but they're not getting that much attention. Uh, we talked about moms who would say, yeah, my kid just had to learn to scream in a stroller and be in their stroller for five hours. And I think too, like, so as much as we heard people love having their kids around, they also would not mind help. <laughs> and help can come in a lot of different ways, right? But, um, and what we heard too is that they are absolutely the people who will never use childcare, no matter what. But I think they're a minority. And I, I haven't done the math exactly. You know, I, I need to go back and look at how many times these different things come up, right? Most of the time we heard like, oh man, like if there was childcare that was available, affordable, we will use it because it's that idea that they're doing these very dangerous jobs with little kids around. So the level of stress that we heard from these women was through the roof. Um, almost every group, one woman, at least one woman talked about being deep, like having been diagnosed, having a form of depression, prepartum, postpartum, Later on, um, women talked about having tried to find help, could not find it. And so that's the other thing, too, is in the U.S., there has been a lot of initiatives to support mental health. And I think in Canada, too, there's been a lot more discussion about mental health in agriculture. But we tend to think of farmer as this, like, you know, as older or as, as men, right? When you look at the pamphlets for mental health and stress stuff, it's always, almost always a picture of a man. <laughs> older <laughs> um the picture of the mom with like three kids in tow that never happens but man that really needs to happen because we just did so in our last stage of the study we just did a survey of farm parents and here we asked anyone involved in raising children on farms so it could be biological foster parent uh, grandparents, um, we asked them, you know, fill out the survey. So we ended up hearing from 860 people from all over the U.S. And I think that it's 40% of people said that in their household, someone has been, has had pre or postpartum depression. It feels huge. And we, I don't think we talk about these things. Well, and it seems like, too, when we're talking about the farm business, even if it's not a dangerous production part of the farm business, you know, we don't ask ad executives in New York City to take three kids to the office with them and expect them to get something done. You know, it's They would be it's looked down right? Yeah. You know, and yeah. it's, it's, when we were doing farmer's market, you know, I had so many people say, well, it's so great that you can bring your kids with you. And I'm like, I... I love my kids more than anything, but they're not super helpful. You know, I mean, they're, they're five and six. They want to run, run around in circles. You know, they're not helpful, really. I mean, sometimes they are, but not by and large. And, and then, God forbid, you get the people who say things like, 
well, just tell them not to do X, Y, and Z. Or like, <laughs> you know, even if I'm fairly sure that they won't, I'm not willing to literally stake their lives on their ability to remember that I told them not to run out in a driveway when grandpa's driving tractors around. You know, yeah. I mean, it's that's literally a life or death consequence. I'm not going to. I mean, I feel like I'm a pretty good parent, but I'm not going to stake, you know, their lives on how solidly I've parented a five-year-old. You know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. And yeah, I think I hadn't really considered it, but the, the far mental health stuff we see is so much about older men talking about crop prices being bad and not, you know... We can't access health care, or I have an aging family member that I can't care for, or I have children that I can't care for, or whatever yeah. else it is. It's never about that other stress. And to just address the, the chemical parts of mental health care without addressing actually having support for families doesn't really do that much good. Um, yeah. And I don't want to take away the fact that, you know, you know, folks in agriculture, right, need support and, and that the challenges are not real, right, uh, of the older farmer struggling with the, the prices. Like, I don't want to take that away. Like, that's, that's real, right? But at the same time, that scope of what we talk about needs to be much broader um, and, and the differences in realities too along the life course. I, I was talking with someone yesterday. She said, oh man, like when, when the children were old enough to go to school, oh, that was such a breath of fresh air because <laughs> they were out of my way for many hours. And so we often talk about school as the place where people, you know, where kids get educated. It's also a form of child care where you know that between this time and this time, the kids are not around. Uh, and we heard that over and over again, right? How like the crazy jigsaw puzzles that people play and be like, all right, like between this time and this time, the kids are out. So I'm going to do like all these things and I've got my giant to-do list. So people are like, you know, like going super fast through these things. And then like from the safety perspective, right? Is like, we know that from the safety perspective, you need to take time and not rush through things because that tends to be when accidents happen. But I think, too, the thing that really puzzles me, and it's a tricky one for me to talk about because it, the, the, the farm safety programming t spends a lot of time telling people what to do and what not to do. But again, like with the child care piece, has never formally spent time thinking about how child care is expensive, is not there. And so I think like telling parents, don't bring your children to the work site, becomes tone death quickly when folks don't have other alternatives. And it's like, well, what do you want me to do? Um, and so I think there's that extra layer of like, yeah, I know they're not supposed to be there. Um, you know, when we asked if parents were concerned that their, par their kids could get hurt, I think it was, I don't remember the number. I, I don't want to misquote it, but it was quite high that you have a, a high level of like the mental burden of knowing your kids could get hurt at any time but you don't know what to do you don't know what are their alternatives or what to do well and i th think too to me that was such a it's such a large part of doing this podcast is mm -hmm. at least giving parents permission that no maybe it's not ideal for your kid to watch as much tv as they do i know my kids watch a lot of tv we heard that but it's lot. safer yeah, than them like being the out in the driveway here. <laughs> like, you know yeah. so I mean is it ideal no is it safer yes you know so yeah. do that thing and hopefully we'll come up with some better plan along the way but you know um yeah. so as someone with kids in rural child care and I was just um doing a little googling here my kids are five and six so they're you know in school but during the summer we're paying about twelve hundred to fourteen hundred dollars a month for childcare, and I mean, that's not out of line at all for what childcare no. runs. A lot of centers around here have 
six to 12 month wait lists. Um, I'm on the board for our daycare as well. And I can tell you that $1,400 a month for two kids is not anywhere close to breaking even for the center, let alone actually making money. And they are a community nonprofit, but they still can't afford to just throw money out the door. Um, but you still have to pay your staff and feed children and pay for insurance. Um, the community we live in has a poverty rate of 43%. So paying for childcare at a rate of $14,000 a year in a town where the median family income is 56000 is um, not really working out. I mean, it's, what, like 28% of their annual income? And that's for two kids. That's not for a bigger family or infants, which is more expensive. Um, so how do we get people to understand on a on a larger scale level that child care is not a family problem, that it is a community problem, and that investing in kids being safe and growing up with early intervention for things they might need, with good community support, with that, you know, that good child care can be such a benefit to families and to children, but it's seen as such a, like, well, if you can't afford daycare, that's because you should get a better job, you know, not... Or you should not have children. Yeah, or you shouldn't have children. Like, cool, yeah. so there's this huge lack of young farmers, but don't have kids because you won't be able to support them. Yeah. And, and Katie, yeah. I, I would say too, it's, it's a business, it's, it's a business issue. And what we've seen in recent years, in particular since COVID is how much more the business community has gotten on board with the importance of childcare. Um, just my County here, my rural County, um, they now have a childcare task force and they released a survey to the business community to ask about what are the needs you offer it as benefit. Um, I think it's um, the, what I'm hearing is, I think that we have reached a point where in a lot of places we, people are ready to do something about it, but it's how do we go about it and the complexity of starting any kind of child care center, given the economics that you just talked about. So when we were doing the survey um, earlier this year, um, we, I would get emails from people who said, hey, I saw your survey. I'm in rural Washington state and child care is really a problem here. And we've been trying to start a center here, but we hit roadblocks after roadblocks. And then through the survey too, I was connected to a farmer in Indiana who about three years ago, his name is Adam Madison, um, got really tired <laughs> of not good child care options. And he formed a nonprofit organization with other folks. Um, they worked really hard to find funding. They partnered with the local um, healthcare system. Um, they went after grants and just in the last couple of months, they opened their child care center, 70 spots. Uh, they already have a wait list. But my sense is like, it, it was very hard, right? And so in terms of what do we do about it, right? What solutions do people want to see? I think it's the other part too that not everybody wants um, a child care center solutions and it's not it's not realistic for a lot of rural communities because we don't have enough children around um, to maintain a child care. But like family-based care, right? Like where going to someone's house is a really good solution in particular when your work schedule is not reliable or you have long working hours, you have varying needs. Um, and I think COVID too has really impacted um, child care supply. Um, it, it's hard and, and there are clearly people who've been working on these issues for years, for decades, right? Child care advocates, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center um, is a center you might have heard of uh, out of um, DC that has done a lot of wonderful work on child care for anyone, right? Not just um, farming. Um, and it has done a lot of survey work to ask parents, like really what's going on um, and a, a lot of the time too, though, at the same time, when we look at those child care advocacy groups, the rural, the, the, the specific needs of rural communities might not have received as much attention and the specific needs of farmers or anyone with, um, you know, self-employed folks, I would say, 
hasn't necessarily received a lot of attention. And so I think that some of the solutions that have been pushed forward, um, in particular around center-based care, there's been a lot of push in recent years from what I understand towards more quality, uh, more quality gradings, um, which tends to be more of a center-based things. And again, that doesn't work for a lot of things. Uh, we've heard a lot of farm parents saying, I don't want to send my kid to daycare, but if I could have someone come help me at the farm, that would be easier because this way I have the kids around. And also like we talk to people who say, I would have to drive 40 minutes. <laughs> That's like so much of my day. Um, as far as solutions though, I know that the show won't be aired it for a little bit, but this year is a farm bill year. Um, and there's been conversations around uh, child care for the farm sector. The two largest organizations in the U.S., the American Farm Bureau um, and the National Farmers Union, have added child care as a priority, affordable, accessible child care as a priority in their policy book for the farm bill. And that's huge, right? Because usually those policy books are all about the farm business, right? Uh, what is crop insurance going to look like? What are you know, the pricing structure is going to look like. And so the fact that now there is that the child care piece is very big. Um, the National Rural Health Association also released their letter um, of priorities for the Farm Bill that they sent to the Act Committee, both in the Senate and in the House, and they added child care. Um, and actually, they um, it, it was, I, I was able to talk to them. They actually reached out to me and they said, we want to hear what we can do to support the farm, to support farm safety, farm health and safety. And I showed up to the meeting with a list of five things. <laughs> they kept two. <laughs> Dr. Kevin was, was one of those. But anyways, I'm saying that because there is a bill that is drafted um, that would look at using existing USDA programs um, and would target them for both physical and social infrastructure, would target them uh, to child care, for child care in rural areas. It's not, it's a very small, I, I don't, I don't want to downplay it at all, right? I think it will bring in infusion of resources, but will it fix the issue? No, but it's a starting point in the sense that we're talking about it. Yeah, and talking, I mean, obviously is, is the f first step and and so much of that, I mean, I don't have to tell you, but to our listeners, you, research is the basis of a lot of these conversations, right? Until there's research, the type that you're doing, there's there's no way to to justify and to prove, you know, that this is a priority and that people need it. So that's a, a huge piece of why your work is so important. So you talked a bit about your current research. Um, what are the, the next steps that you're working on and what, yeah, what, what are the next steps and what you come, hope comes out of your work in the end? I know it's probably one of those things that's just ongoing, <laughs> it rolls, rolls into the, the next questions, but where, where are you going from here? From here? Oh, man. <laughs> so this is just a small, it's not a small thing, but it's, you know, only one of the projects I'm working on, mm -hmm. another project I'm working on. Um, is looking at mental health and uh, what what folks in agriculture do when they experience challenges, uh, mental health challenges. Um, and it's both looking at kind of going back to what we were saying a little bit ago. It's not only about people's decisions and what they choose to do, but it's also the context in which they're making those decisions. Um, it's about what does the community look like? What does access to resources look like? Because we can tell people all day long, you need to get help. But if help is not there, then you know where are we going? And so it's also about understanding how the how the community influences both mental health challenges as well as response to mental health challenges. And the community we're also talking about the the economy, the farm economy, the local community. What does access to healthcare look like? What does access? What, what does the community look like? Right? What what's the what's the social fabric looks like? Is that a community where people get together when there is an issue of any kind? Um, and so it's really moving beyond, a lot of the research that has been done is really focused on individuals and really about let's educate people, uh, let's um, tell them what to do and change their behavior and then it'll fix the problem. 
This project is really more about what are the big underlying structural issues going on and the extent to which we're addressing these underlying structural solutions. As far as the childcare project goes, um, we have a couple of years left on the grant. We have a lot, we are still working through um, the data analysis. We're about to release a research brief with the, the key findings uh, from the findings. And as far as establishing it as an issue, you're right, Arlene, because until we have those numbers to really talk about it, to really show there is a problem, I think it's, it, it's harder, right? Some sneak peek about the survey findings is that 75% of the people that we talked to, and there was 860 farmers across the country who have at least one kid under 18, 75, about 75%, 74% to be precise, said that they experienced a childcare challenge, and those childcare challenges were defined as a matter of cost, availability, um, distance to um, childcare, quality, as well as um, philosophy. Does your value align with those of, your, of the caregiver? 75%, 74%, cost and access were the biggest issue. Uh, when we asked about, you know, does, we had some questions about, you know, how much are the children of the, in the workplace because of lack of alternative options? Um, that was over 50% said, yeah, the kids are with me because I don't have other things to do. And the last thing I said about, I, I want to say is around, do people want this to be talked about? <laughs> Loudly and clearly, when we asked, do you believe that the USDA and farm organizations should represent farmers in national child care policy discussion, 76% said yes to farm organizations being involved, 71% to yes to USDA. So if things weren't clear yet, <laughs> yeah, now they are. <laughs> yes, exactly. And what I want to say too, and don't that's, yeah, that's don't tell really us important. that childcare is not an issue that people care about because now we have the numbers to show you yeah. that people want to talk about childcare. Yeah, yeah, and what was interesting too is about sixty percent of the people who responded are multi generational farmers, and the rest are first generational farmers. And so we also talked to like a large you know, um, these two groups that have some important differences um, when we look at other things. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, when we asked about solutions, we had a list of 19, 18 different solutions. And we had anything, we had kind of very low hanging fruit to like very like big picture solutions. We had, would you like more information about how to keep the kids safe or how to assign duties safely? Would you like more information about child care options in your community, um, then would you like um, things directly connected to child care, like um, child, child care tax credits, um, universal, uh, you know, um, child care, uh, the way that K-12 schools work, so kind of like universal child care. Um, and then we had like affordable health insurance, we had um, financial assistance, or we had support when people are pregnant or about or when the kids were just born so my turn to leave um and then we had what else did we have uh, transportation uh, so when we slice when we look at the numbers so guess what was number one out of the ones i listed i, I listed the one that's top and that's a survey about child care and asking what would make it easier for you to raise the children on the farm and grow your business or something like that wasn't quite the question but was health care up there this is all Americans. Yeah, it was seventy seven percent. Yeah. Yeah, the U the US. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can't look Canada in there. Seventy seven percent said health insurance. And we were not surprised because that came up a lot in the focus groups last year. But it it, it, it goes back to the beginning of the conversation and how it's all connected. Things that are like information, those low hanging fruit, kind of towards the bottom of the pile. Really what people we saw a lot of Really what folks want is things that are actually going to make things better on a day-to-day -day basis. So how does rural child care in the U.S. compare to other countries? And what solutions are you seeing that communities are coming up with? I'm going to take notes for our own local i'm on the board of our community child care and it's it is damn frustrating you know and i know that one issue we're really seeing is that there's people have been able to get better jobs which 
is greater, you know, higher paying jobs. But when you can start at the local gas station for $18 an hour with benefits, or you can start at the local daycare at, you know, $14 an hour with no benefits, plus you have to wipe snotty noses all day, um, not a lot of people want to do that. And I mean, understandably, but it's... Uh, and, and I'm really hoping you have so some genius suggestions from someplace for us. When I was going to turn it to Arlene first, but I was going to say, they're not, they are parallels with agriculture, where we say there's a lot of challenges finding recruiting labor to work on farms. And again, when you look at, the, I think the pays is different, right? There are some places where, where the pays are higher. There are some commodities that, that pay higher, but a lot of the time don't come with benefits, very long hours hard work, hard physical work, there are similarities too in the sense that, well, you can go work at McDonald's. Came, McDonald's and Target came up all the time when I was work, talking to childcare um, folks who work in the childcare sector. They're like, we can't compete with McDonald's and Target. Um, but um, yeah, Arlene, what does Canada do? Well, I'm also on the board of our a local childcare agency and um, the one program that our agency runs is licensed home child care. So like you were talking about um, centers in people's homes. Um, so there are also a lot of government programs that for subsidizing, um, subsidizing on the individual level. So people who are low income to subsidize their child care rates, as well as subsidizing programs. Um, so there, there is money from, from the government that goes into those programs. And across the country, I know they're working on a national child care strategy. The, the goal is to have $10 a day child care for children preschool age. Um, so that's rolling out. It's not going to be universal in the sense that you know there just aren't there there aren't the spaces but but it's happening it already has been happening in some places but that requires a lot a lot of taxpayer dollars there's no no way around that um universal um in our in our jurisdiction it's universal full day kindergarten from age well, it depends where, when your child's birthday is, but junior kindergarten and senior kindergarten. So the year a child turns four and the year a child, child turns five, um, there's full day, every day kindergarten across the province. Now, that is good for, in a lot of ways, but the, the one thing that did happen is that took a lot of early childhood educators out of private daycares and child care centers and moved them into the education system um, because they can make more. And I mean, these are also trained professionals. I mean, we want, especially in, in center-based care and in, in home care as well, we want people who are experienced in child development and, and how to look after children in the best way to interact with them, to educate them, all those things. And that's that's that takes skill and training and education for the for the people doing that work so so our kindergarten programs are run by both a teacher and an early childhood education educator in the classroom together for those jk and sk years so those are some of the the canadian things i mean there's still lots of gaps um in rural areas in in particular but i do feel like licensed home child care is a is a great way to, to offer care in places and also provide economic opportunities for people who don't have other options who want to be able to keep their own kids at home potentially i mean you can you have to count your own kids towards your ratios but um you can you can stay home with your own children and, and take a couple more kids in and that could supplement supplement your income it's something that someone could do on farm, you know, like with the proper safety protocols, you have to have fenced yards and all of that kind of stuff. But it's things that people could could bring more income into the into the family in a rural area and not have to leave home. So those are some of the ways that that it's happening here. Arlene, I'm going to interject it. It seems like there's such a parallel too between childcare and farming being undervalued that it's you know, mm -hmm. because they've both been sort of silent work that somebody else did and then the benefits show up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, that honestly, as a parent, I don't want the center my kids go to employing people who'd rather be working at McDonald's. I want them employing people who are passionate and excited and 
are getting education and want to be there. Mm-hmm. You know, because they are teachers. Just because they're looking after babies doesn't mean they're, yeah. not, <laughs> they're not still teachers. Mm-hmm. I am astounded at the stuff my kids have learned at daycare. And other than uh, the drawing of the pooping mermaid that my kid brought home the other day. <laughs> and I she didn't, lear- <laughs> she didn't learn it from the daycare staff. Was it a good drawing, you know, though? I another mean... child. It was a great yeah, drawing. See, she's still which learning. she has learned at daycare. <laughs> and, you know, my kids loved daycare and they love preschool, which is also run by our daycare center. And... They're learning so much, and they're getting to be such members of the community, and there is no value high enough to place on that. And so I think we really have to change the whole way we discuss it, because if your children aren't the top priority in the community, and I mean for the whole community, not just for the parents, but they should be the highest priority, and that's... They're the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, that, that question of how do countries do it is, is one of my research interests. Um, some of my dissertation research actually looked at social policies for France, in France and in the U.S. for the agricultural sector and the ways in which social policy has been tailored or not tailored for the particular needs of the farm sector Um, France was a a very easy choice in the sense that I grew up there, but France stands out as a country, it's not the only one, but stands out as a country that uh, from very early on, uh, you know, in the 19th, 20th century, as it was developing its social safety nets, really worked to adapt it to the specific needs of the farm sector. And and it does so with other occupational groups. And saying that um, the idea is that we want, as a society, we want people that have access to, um, we want a system that's equitable. So that might not be equal because that might not make sense. So in terms of family benefits, what does that look like in France? Um, if you're going to have a baby or adopt a baby, um, you're eligible for parental leave. Um, and over the years too, it's moved from being for women only to being also for the dad. Um, and other, you know, and, and it's very similar models in, in other countries like Nordic, Nordic European countries, uh, Spain. Uh, but essentially for the farm sector, what he says is that, well, if you have a farm, um, the animals still need to be fed, even if you are, you know, going to have, you know, a baby. Uh, the crops still need to be tended. Like you cannot put your business on hold. Maybe some people can, can but most people cannot put their farm business on hold. So instead of getting, um, you know, paid, you know, if if you are a salaried worker, what you get, um, you will get your, um, you know, your your salary paid for as your maternity leave or paternity leave. What it does in France is for the the farm sector, um, it pays for a temp farmer. Essentially, it's like, or think of it as a substitute teacher model. And at the national level, Finland also has an interesting model. As a, at a national model, at a national national level, you have different. Each region, I guess, has their own system, but it's connected to the national model. Um, and they have this system of people or of a pool of people who are experienced working in agriculture. So that could be retired farmers. That could be farmers who have a small farm that they have ec- extra time to work on other farms. Um, that can also be students um, who are um, in ag, ag colleges and ag technical schools who want to operate um, their own farm at some point. Um, and essentially what it does is those folks um, go work on the farm for a while um, so that you know the, the parents can have time to be with the children. Uh, a lot of the family benefits too, I think Arlene, you talked about it a little bit, are, are long enough too so that you know even in the U.S., even if you... Um, are eligible for uh, FLMA, um, FSLMA, sorry, I never remember, the, the family leave. Um, it's very short and it's not paid and you, you have to take, you know, use PTO. Um, and also the, the big difference too in France is kindergarten starts two and a half or three years old. So it's much sooner than the US. So you also have access to that day long or half day um, school. Um, and as far as childcare, um, it's a lot of um, different options. Um, center care, but also family-based care is really important. That's what my mom did. 
um, and parents get financial support um, to pay for it. Um, I don't think that care that child care providers in France are getting rich uh, by any means. It's not an occupation that pays a whole lot. But I do think, you know, thinking about my own experience, you know, and my mom, uh, she it, it also didn't feel like she was way underpaid. Um, but the idea too is we know that parents cannot pay the full cost of child care. Um, you know, it, it's that weird thing, right? And as a society, um, France is one of those countries that has decided that ensuring that children are well educated, well taken care of is a priority. Um, and so resources are made available. And again, not a perfect model. Um, are the taxes higher? Uh, I actually compared the rates in the US and France uh, for payroll taxes. Is it higher? Yes, but not that much higher. And when you start thinking about what people get for the taxes that they pay versus what we pay here with our taxes and all the extra stuff that we have to pay, I would wager it's really similar what we end up paying, um, but the level of, but we don't get the same thing. Yeah, I've always found it interesting too that we have decided at some point that school is a public access, it's a public good, we don't have to pay for that, but early childhood education we do. And what the, I know there's probably, I'm sure there's a lot of historical context around, you know, women's work and women supposed to staying home, supposed to stay home and look after their kids and all of those types of things. But the the ways in which we have decided that school is, is a public good, but early childhood education is not. And I'm sure there's lots of, <laughs> Lots of context there that we don't actually need to get into today, but it's a it's an interesting <laughs> interesting place that that everyone seems to be kind of trying to figure out. And it's a long-standing issue, right? Back so it's back in the nineteen eighties, um, the USDA did a research project with women in agriculture and asked them what they wanted. Um, Child care, support with child care was something that came up back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, still not here. <laughs> so, you know, COVID is not, you know, I, I feel like there's been a lot of like, oh, like this is new with COVID. It's like, no, it is not. That this has been, uh, you know, when Shoshana started working on that research, that was way before COVID. When we proposed the project that I talked about today, that was before COVID um, because the problems were have been around for a long time and really and and you know from like from a researcher perspective right or when when any of us reflects right on our life and what kind of impact if any have we had and has it been positive and and are we um leaving um are we going to leave earth in in a better place right because of the work that we've done you know as a researcher it's really really hard right because in particular if you look at social and economic issues um, a lot of the time they require, um, a, a lot of the time, one effective way to fix them is through policy. Um, and, and policy can take years, right? And so I think from that perspective, I, w I was um, hearing someone saying, you know, this is an ultra marathon. It's not even a marathon. <laughs> like... Yeah, one, one step at a time, right? Um, one yeah. of the statistics that I found in some of your research that was really scary and, you know, sobering was that every day in the U.S. about 33 children are injured and that every three days a child dies in an agricultural related accident and that 60 percent of ag related injuries are sustained by the children you talked about, the, the non-working children, you know, like our, our youngest and most vulnerable. So. I know that as parents, we are probably always thinking about the dangers on farm, but you can you talk about what some of the, the major risk factors are? You know, obviously supervision being being a big one, but um, can you talk about some of the, the most critical points that we should kind of think about more? I mean, I don't want to add more stress to people's lives because I feel like <laughs> we're always, always thinking about those things. But yeah, you know, on a statistical sense, what, what are the yeah. things that we need to be most conscious of? Yeah, tractor. Tractor is a big, big one, as well as ATVs. Um, and even 
body seats and 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 what i'm going to give you talk about now is the is the more like you know, like the, the, the recommendations by farm safety experts and, and what the research says that I think is a bit separate from the reality of what happens and what sure, people can yeah. do, right? Body seats are not made for children. Body seats are to teach someone how to drive the tractor, from what I understand. Um, even with a cab, um, tractors are not seen as a safe place because you have vibrations. Uh, you might have a door that gets opened by accident or, you know, the the you know, whoever's driving the tractor might need to hop off to do something, get back in. You know, who knows what the kids uh, might do when that happens. Um, and even and the reality is in our research, you know, when we did the photo voice and we asked uh, women to, to take pictures of what they do during the workday to keep the children safe, uh, we saw a lot of um, baby seats. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, different contractions and, and people are trying hard. You know, they are they're doing their best with what they have. Um, we've also were, heard that sometimes being in the cab, and I think Arlene, you you alluded to that, being in the cab might be the safest place considering what's going around the tractor. Um, as far as risk, dangerous large animals um, are also a big source of risk. Um, any kind of lagoon, any kind of hole that has any kind of liquid where people can drown, um, I think is also a major um, source of risk. Um, and there is also, I think not as big of a risk, but also, you know, any kinds of um, chemicals that might be around the farm that needs to be, you know, tightened up. Um, but even, you know, sometimes what we heard sometimes from um, farmers who farm, um, so we heard a lot from dairy farmers, large scale row crop, where obviously you have, you know, cows and, and tractors and implements. But we also heard from farmers who operate maybe smaller scale uh, vegetable farms. Um, and one thing that struck with me, and, and I think like there's the sense of like these are safer. But one thing that struck to me is this mom who said, I had finally brought my kid for the first time in the greenhouse. It was a toddler who walked around. Within two minutes or not even a minute, he had found the sharp stuff. Um, and I think it was like a hand tool or something. And so um, the other thing, too, is we know that on some of the smaller farms, in particular, when people are first starting off, they might buy older tractors. So they might not have the PTO, um, but they also might not have other safety features. Um, and, you know, a lot of the reasons why folks might buy these tractors is because it's better. The size of the tractor is better suited for the scale of their operation, but also it's better suited for their budget. But then he doesn't have the extra safety features. Um, and so it, it, it's the tricky part, right? Because at the same time, if you don't have childcare, I, I think one thing we haven't talked about too is traditionally there's this idea that in agriculture, um, it, it takes a village to raise children, right? That, that's something that is commonly said in agriculture and outside. Um, we've heard from folks, uh, from any folks who have a wonderful village, to help them who have parents, grandparents, neighbors, friends um, who are there to help. We heard folks who don't have that support. Uh, we heard folks who said that um, they were really hoping that their mom would help with childcare, uh, but they're still working. They need to work or they have a health condition that make it that they can't do it. We heard from countless women that would talk about how they don't trust their father in law or their fathers, because they felt that they were very unsafe <laughs> and that they would do things that they're not comfortable with, right? Um, and we also heard from folks that are first-generation farmers who moved to a new area to buy land, um, and then they don't have family to help them. And so it's also like that idea of like, oh, you know, people have, you know, family to help them. Not everyone. Not everyone trusts their family. Um, families can have a lot of drama associated to it. And it might be very uncomfortable to, to talk about it. Um, it's There's a stigma too around it, right? And so I think childcare from that perspective is, that's the, it's also why it's important to have alternative solutions because not everyone. I mean, we um, it's, a story, it's a story that Shoshana heard from a woman years ago who said that um, the, the, her kid had, she comes back to the house, the, the kid had been with her mom she came to realize that her mom hadn't changed the diaper in six hours and came to realize that her mom had Alzheimer. Um, but also, 
that she don't have other choice but that having her mom continue to look after her. And so there is like also like sure there is family around, but are they able or willing? I mean the other thing too is we heard of um, women who would say my parents want to have nothing to do with the kids. They spend their entire career working really hard. They raise their own kids and now they want to go, uh, they want to be snowbirds um, and they don't want to have to do anything with the kids or they don't want to be the primary caregivers. And so it's also like kind of the idea that there's like all these different things going on that we often don't talk about. Um, a lot of people don't want to admit it, right? Because it's, it's kind of looked down upon um, because we're expected to have these great families where everyone is there yeah, it's so other. true. And it's a, it's again expecting that free labor out of, I mean, primarily women, even yeah. into their senior years that yep. we would expect grandmothers to just willingly continue to give and give and give and take care of young children more than full time for no pay. <laughs> Right. You know what? Why is yep. this an expectation or, or a, uh, that we that we hold this up as a virtue, even that that this is something that that mm -hmm. is is the best for everyone? You know, who is it best for? Probably nobody. <laughs> I mean, if if grandma would like to take care of the children, yep. that's fantastic. But but the, yeah, that expectation that this is this is how it should be or that this is this is the best the best scenario. I mean, we, we shouldn't expect that of people. Well, and, and also you have the, the sandwich generation, right? Where folks in their middle year might be looking after the kids, but they might also be looking after an older parents. So we asked the question in the survey and we found 17% um, said, or 2017, said that they are take caring for both young, young kids as, as well as adults. I think too, and I'm... I'm going to guess this is not just our family, that the impact on the dynamic, I would guess between daughters and fathers, but especially daughters-in-law and fathers-in-law of uh, what happens on the farm to keep kids safe. And, you know, like my father-in-law farms with us and he's losing his vision and he's losing his hearing. And... On the one hand, I'm definitely not going to tell him that he can't farm here or he can't drive a tractor, you know, because A, it's not going to happen, and B, I'd be out of the family real quick. But <laughs> B, I mean, we need the help. We can't turn away the labor, but it it does make me even more nervous to have my kids out in the yard because I know that his vision is hearing his reaction time is impaired. And two arguments like how old a kid has to be before they can be on an open station tractor. I mean, the cab certainly isn't the safest place, but it's got to be safer than the seat of a 70-year-old tractor with no rollover protection and no protection on a PTO. And, you know, like we had a neighbor kid who almost killed his dad throwing the tractor into gear to, to drive it through a gate to help his daddy out when he was like four and a half. And, you know, my, my five-year-old is sure that he can drive the car now because he's five. So, you know, between the older farmers who are less safe and the, the real young farmers who aren't safe, because both of them think that they're capable of a lot more than they safely are, I guess that's maybe the issue, is that both of them have much higher uh, ideals of what their abilities are than is really... Uh, yeah accurate yeah yeah and that, we've heard that too yeah sorry I was gonna say we've heard that too a lot from parents saying their kids love the farm and in particular the little boys are like attracted to the heavy machinery and the the struggle of like putting the kids away from these like dangerous things like was really was hard like was an extra challenge it was almost, it felt like it was almost easier to have a kid who was like, I want not have nothing to do with this. Easier in some ways, in the sense that they're not getting close to the dangerous stuff. Harder in the sense that it's harder to bring them along. And, um, you know, so, yeah. No I, kids are, no one kid are the same. I absolutely feel that, you know, my kids have days where all they want is to watch TV and eat fruit snacks. <laughs> and as much as I hate that, at least I know where they are. 
and they're not going to get run over sitting on the couch. You know, the as much as I love having them out farming with us, some part of me sees them come out the door and it's just like, today's probably the day that they're going to get run over. You know, this is definitely the day that they're going to get attacked by a rooster and one of their eyes is going to get poked out or something, you know, <laughs> something horrible is going to happen. And I, I hate having that feeling of just, you know, what can I do to let them be farm kids in the most not dangerous to their health kind of way? And to this feeling like we can only prioritize their safety for like things that will actually kill them and not, you know, like I definitely don't feel like I have the resources to like protect their emotional health on the farm. You know, I'm like, you didn't get run over. I feel good about that. You know, like <laughs> where any injury that's not like permanently disabling is seen as kind of a, well, we got lucky, you know, nobody died. Um, it would be nice to have some wiggle room and feel like we could prevent, you know, hearing damage or orthopedic damage or whatever and not just be trying to keep our kids alive. Um, yeah. yeah. So I guess that, that leads real nicely into asking how we shift this discussion of responsibility and fault for accidents because it feels so much like I mean, I don't know any farmers who don't at least know somebody who was killed in an accident. And it feels so much like every accident, the first thing you hear is, well, what were they doing? Like, you know, what what mistake did they make that caused this to happen? And that the more strange an accident is, the easier it is to write it off as, well, that could never happen to me. But you know, I know the people who were killed and the people whose children were killed didn't, you know, go, oh, this is probably a horrible, dangerous thing to do, but we're going to let our kids do it anyway because they'll be fine. You know, I mean, I assume that nobody thinks it's going to happen to them, but it seems like we skip so much discussion of how to be safer if we never admit that it, you know, the only thing keeping us safe is good luck on a lot of things, which isn't great to talk about, but um, yeah, I guess I'm... Yeah, it's, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. It, it's, it's a tricky one, one that, you know, I don't think about as much because I spend so much time looking at what, what are the things, you know, kind of like what are the bigger challenges and less about how people process it. I, I do have some of the colleagues at the National Children's Center think more in terms of, you know, how do people, how do farm parents kind of make those decisions and, and um, justify is not the right word, but like the, what's the mental model that people use. Um, one of my colleague to um, some colleagues are looking at you know it, it's not an accident it's an incident from the perspective that in risk management everything is predictable um, the thing is I'm not sure at, at the end of the day what difference does it make if we're not addressing the structural level issues is it to say that if we made it, I guess the, the, the question is, is it to say that countries with better support for childcare have less incident um, on farms? Um, I don't think that we actually have very good data on that. I think anecdotally is that yes, there are less, uh, less incidents. I think that also gets us into laws. Um, and I know that it's a very, very prickly topic, but there are laws around you're not allowed to have a kid on a construction site. But yet you can have uh, children on dangerous work site. Um, and even some states are rolling back on child labor laws. Um, and, and, we're, and, and so I think those are like very murky discussions. Emotions run high very quickly but it does bring up questions are around sure kids be there in the first place. I, I don't know. Like to, to me, it, it's super tricky, right? Um, 
Because if you run a restaurant, you you do see sometimes the kids around, right? Because same thing, like those, you know, if, if folks have the restaurant open for dinner, child care is not going to be open. So the kids are around until they go to, until they go to bed. Um, yeah, I don't know. Arlene, what do you think? You're muted. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know why I was having trouble unmuting there. I I do like what you said there about it being an incident. You know, the the fact that it happened, it it doesn't matter so so much about I I think it's part of human nature, Katie. What when you're talking about about trying to to explain away someone else's accident. That's just the, yeah, the, the mental gymnastics of like, well, I don't do that specific thing, so I'm going to be all right. We, we want to convince ourselves that someone else's accident was their fault because then we can kind of justify the fact that we haven't gotten hurt by saying we're doing it right. And I don't think there, there is a, a, a right way necessarily. I mean, there's definitely some wrong ways. <laughs> and like you, like you said, Florence, it, it is really hard to ha to come up with hard and fast rules because agriculture is, is an industry that is, is difficult to, to regulate. There's a lot of cultural and historic, you know, expectations around what we do. But, but I do feel like we, we do need to, to acknowledge the gray area, because like even when you talked about at the beginning, so much of our, our farm literature, farm programming is around, this is a wonderful, beautiful way to raise a family. But it doesn't, doesn't acknowledge, like we said at the beginning, doesn't acknowledge that these are work sites and there are so many risk factors and that we need, there needs to be more support on an individual basis and that has to come from systematic change but but farmers need supports in a variety of ways in creative ways um you know maybe it has to come in the, in the form of creating things like you know i mean everyone we know everyone's using buddy seats for kids so let's acknowledge that and maybe put some harnesses in there so that we can safely attach a car seat so we're not going into facebook groups and saying how are you tethering your kid into this tractor because I need to do it. Instead, maybe coming up with conversion kits so that we can say, yeah, you know, you know, these these are the risks, same as a vehicle. I mean, when we drive around, we know there's risks every day. We could get in a car accident, our kids could get hurt. But at least if we could have tether straps and have our kids properly secured in a tractor, then we could feel at least for a few hours that they were in a safe place and that we weren't just jimmying something up to make something pass, to acknowledge the realities of the way people are actually living instead of just having, this isn't safe and so don't do it, to, to ch change the conversation into, this is the reality and let's talk about how to actually make things work for people. Arlene, I think that's yeah. a great point because honestly, I had no idea that body seats were specifically dangerous for children you know i mean everyone we know throws a buddy seat in their tractor and puts the kid on it you know it's it's when you graduate from sleeping on the window well behind the seat to being able to stay awake long enough to to sit next to somebody and i think as a parent i would love to see you know what age is relatively safe enough to ride on a tractor, what age is relatively safe enough to drive a tractor, what age is, you know, because I get so much pushback, and I know a lot of other parents do as well, for, you know, well, I was driving a tractor by the time I was six, like, cool, was it a good idea? Probably not, you know, you live to tell the tale, that doesn't mean it was... And okay it's the same conversation do. that comes you up know, around and... seat belts and bikes without helmets. Well, I survived, so it's okay. Sure, you did. You're alive to tell the story, right? Same thing. But does it mean that everyone survived? No, that's why those safety things were brought into effect is because 
we need seatbelts in cars because people fly through windshields because the people who didn't survive don't get to live and say it was fine because, you know, because they died. <laughs> so let's be, yeah, let's be honest about the risks and actually take a look at some of the ways that people are actually living and try and address those in a way that, that works for people. When I think, yeah, to too, your... oh, sorry, when we're talking about farming, you know, so much of learning how to farm is done as children by doing it. And it's not reasonable to say that, you know, kids won't set foot on the farm until after they graduate high school. But what are the, what are sort of the boundaries for safe ages to do different things? You know, it, at three, is it safe to be around chickens at eight it's safe to be around cattle like it would be nice to have more guidelines for these things because we get so many guidelines for you know what car seat our kids should be in but yeah i've never seen anything about you know how to safely mount a car seat in the tractor and i mean people do it so we should give them <laughs> safer yeah, that because they no, yeah it doesn't exist you know, um... some information about it yeah, so a, a couple of things to your point about the, the car seat. I mean, we saw so many pictures. We, we received about 300 different pictures from people, and we saw so many contraptions on tractors. And and from talking with my farm safety colleagues, I knew, like, that is not supposed to be done. And um, I think, too, from the, the equipment manufacturer's perspective, it's a liability issue, right? And it... it but the thing is, like, I think your conversation, the the point you're making around cars and and car seats and and seat belts, right? Like, we still know we could get killed, uh, but yet we still have them. Um, I think that's a really interesting conversation to have. Um, we I did have a conversation last year with a, a colleague who is an ag engineer, and I was talking to her about some of the things that we were hearing that people want, right? And our conversation didn't go very far, but it's, it's certainly we heard people are saying like, I wish equipment manufacturers would do X, Y, and Z because it make my life easier. Um, as far as age of children, when are they ready to do different tasks? There are different guidelines um, that um, have been put together uh, specifically for agriculture. Um, I don't know if you've seen them. One great resource that I'm going to plug in is cultivatesafety.org. Um, it's run through the children's center, but it also um, get you know it assembles resources from a lot of different places. So there are guidelines specifically around when is a kid old enough to do X, Y, and Z, with the understanding that each kid is different, right? Um, it, not only like emotionally, psychologically, but physically, right? Like not all ten-year-olds are as tall as heavy. And then the other uh, resources that could be interesting too for listeners if they haven't seen them yet are the youth working guidelines. Um, and I think they're being renamed, but essentially they are for a lot of different tasks on the farm. Um, when are children old enough to do them or what, what, are, what do children need to be able to do in order to be ready for that task? And then how do you assign that task safely? What kind of equipment, uh, safety equipment do they have? And then how do you safely supervise children doing that task? Um, and it's specifically from the recognition that, um, as Katie, you said, like it, realistically, you're not, the kids are not going to wait till they're 18 to come into the farm yard. Um, and so it's to straddle kind of those things, right? The kids are going to be around. The kids want, need to be involved, what, you know, whatever the verb is. How is that done safely? I think the biggest challenge that we've seen, though, is for those youngest, youngest kid who are, you know, um, too young even you know the chickens might be fine but the rooster <laughs> is he going to chase yeah, them exactly. <laughs> i think i used to be so scared of my grandpa's rooster <laughs> yeah. it's pretty telling that i just pulled up those guidelines and if you filter by ages six and under it says zero recommended safe tasks which you know um is scary and it's no, but this is a, a really interesting resource, and we'll put it up on the website, because this is... Arlene, I think your kids are going to have some better arguments for getting out of some stuff now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know. Since your kids are old enough to want to get out of stuff, <laughs> yeah, my that's kids right. are only old enough yeah, to want to get into everything. Yeah, the spreadsheet says, I'm not old enough to cut the grass yet. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> 
maybe keep it for yourself and like do yeah. things out. I think that's a good idea though in terms of I mean we've used the same excuse for you know not letting them sit in the front seat right it's like well sorry this is the rule until you're this age you know an airbag can hurt you you can't sit in the front seat of the vehicle that's the rule this is the age but yeah if you have those types of guidelines in front of you as a parent it kind of reminds you and also gives you that justification if you need it you know with family members or whoever or to the kids themselves to say i agree that you want to help me with this task but this is something that you can't do until you're this age i can give you this task to do instead that's safer you know like sweeping scraping poop whatever you know like the the things that keep you uh away from from animals <laughs> yeah, exa yeah exactly yeah exactly you know there there are, <laughs> are tasks that i can i can create um but yeah the actual the actual job descriptions can you can kind of hold them off a little bit and say yeah that's a thing you can do when you're 12 but yeah for now here's the list that's that's accessible to you yep. Yep. katie do you want to do your question I think Florence, we were talking before we came on about the state fair, so I think she's going to have some ideas on this one. Sorry, I was just really <laughs> intrigued by the fact that the guidelines for tractor use involve both physical and mental and social development. Because yes, just yes, because your do. kid's tall and enough to drive a tractor does not mean that they're ready. And yeah, um, yeah, and and you know, and and I'm happy to. I have colleagues at the Children's Center that could come talk in lots and lots of details around those guidelines and and how they were developed, uh, you know, by psychologists and and different level different expertise that came together um, to develop those guidelines. They've been revisited a few times over the years. Um, an interesting resource, uh, you know, that another important resource that could be helpful for parents with the youngest kid is the safe play area and how to design safe play area. So on cultivatesafety.org, there is a booklet that we talk to people, you know, that talks through, here are things to keep in mind as you put, um, you know, a safe play area um, together. What we did, did hear from parents though, is, is the cost of it and how it's not always practical, given how much things tend to move on the farm and you might be, you know, in one area and then the next, but you're, safe play area might be very stationary. Um, and so, uh, but, but still lots of great, uh, you know, practical information around, you know, what, you know, how to do these things on the farm um, you know, to, to help navigate things. All right, well, now that Arlene said that I should actually ask my question and quit <laughs> thinking about how to tell the boy child that it's gonna be nine years before he's potentially old enough to drive a tractor. Uh, good luck with that, but it, it's, um, <laughs> it's such a short amount of time in the great scheme of things. He, uh, the day after his fifth birthday, asked Daddy if he could drive the car home from town because he's five now. So, I'm, um, yeah, that's going to be Daddy's problem to explain to him. That's hilarious. Why he is not old I, enough to drive yet? You know, it was too that it. To be able to touch the pedals. <laughs> Uh, he's a pretty tall kid. He'll figure it out. But oh, um, So we ask all of our guests, if you were going to dominate a category at the county fair, and you can make one up, uh, what would it be? That, that's a great one. Um, I wouldn't be the one who grows the best looking vegetables. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, jam could be one. I, I make a lot of jams. I make um, all our jams every year. Uh, pottery. I do a lot of pottery. It's a great distressor for me. Um, but I'm not really much of a... Um, I'm not a... I... Yeah. I, I live no, in yeah. I pretty wouldn't win. But those, those are, are some great categories. A good jam <laughs> is... Uh, well, maybe we could... Is, uh, is always a, a plus for me. We could have a category of um, throwing your own pots to put the jam in. And yeah, then, yeah, the, you know, yeah, the, yeah. Across, a cross a crossover like category. Yeah, that, that would narrow that, it in, so there, you wouldn't have too much competition yeah. for sure. You know, the, yeah, there's been times when I've thought about what would I do if I quit my job? Because <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we. I mean, I, anyways, um, I've thought about. Um, having an ice cream shop and then making the own pottery bowls. Um, I haven't done it so much in a while, but I used to make a lot of ice cream um, 
it would have been nice to have a cow actually at, some, at that point uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, that could be that too ice cream and bowl and ice cream delicious with i'll sign up to be a judge for that one so we will move into oh, our good. cussing and discussing segment so this is where we can talk about anything from a minor pet peeve to major social issues we've talked a lot about them already today so Listeners, if you want to send in your cussing and discussing, check the show notes. There's a link to our speak pipe where you can leave a voice memo or you can always send us an email and we will read it out for you. Katie, what are you cussing and discussing this week? I hadn't thought ahead, but I've, I've got one for this. Weird medication side effects. I mean, I feel like a lot of side effects are pretty like, you know, nausea, whatever, like you expect that it's not a weird thing whatever do you get the weird ones but i was the medication i'm on currently one of them the side effect is premature facial <laughs> aging <laughs> what <laughs> what and how do you that? know for sure that you're getting that I mean, symptom I, and it's not just time well i mean i yeah i f- i feel better about my face now because I'm like it's a medication side effect it's not <laughs> yeah, just that I'm right. old or that I should take better <laughs> care of my skin but look, what the hell kind of side effect is that and how many people reported <laughs> this in the drug trials that they yeah, were like and how drastic is it is it one of those like they took a picture at the beginning yeah. and at the end of the trial and they aged like 20 years and two weeks or what or if something? this is just like my normal rate of aging and then this side effect is gonna hit and i'm gonna like rip van winkle overnight age like 30 <laughs> years in one night like what is this yeah. that's or like that is, weird that is sweating weird. patterns like cool i got rid of <laughs> one illness but now i'm oddly sweaty at random times like is this really better like <sighs> and my face looks 80 yeah i am old and i'm sweaty great but my asthma's better so <laughs> yeah <laughs> how, it all works out. Is this at the end. Ugh. florence what do you have to cuss and discuss this week well i don't feel like i'm really preparing for this i never am Many but things. it hasn't stopped me yet <laughs> when i like we, we've talked a lot about the, the social piece, and I feel like a little pet peeve. I don't know. Arlene, how about you go in there? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's fine. I will jump in because before we came on, we talked about that scenario where you go into the grocery store with like three things on your list and come out with hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. So where I live, we they don't have plastic bags anymore. They've been banned. And so your options are you bring in the bags that you have in your vehicle, which we all have, you know, like 500 of, or you go into the store with the, the list of three things and you say, well, I'm only getting three things. I don't need to bring my bags. And then you get to the checkout and then you either have to buy more reusable bags to add to your stash of hundreds in your vehicle, or you just <laughs> toss everything back into the cart and then you look like you're shop lifting, but you're like reassuring the cashier like, oh no, I've got lots of bags in my car. So I'll just like bag it in the parking lot. So usually I do kind of a combination. I'll buy like one or two bags for the little stuff and then just like load all the big things, but it's so annoying. Or just the forgetting the bags on a regular grocery one run is super obnoxious too, because you know you're going in for a bunch of stuff and then you have nothing to put it all in. And I'm trying, you know, I want to save the world too, but a few plastic bags would be nice once in a while for free, but they're not allowed. Illegal. That is, they are very much legal here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wisconsin has not a, not a, jumped on that bandwagon yet. They With the paper not. straws. And... No, no, they have not. Um, man, this is a hard one because I feel like it can also reveal a lot about ourselves. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I would say... Um, the it's a pet beef of mine um or or the self-help things that are all over the place about how to help ourselves and like oh just breathe (laughs) and i'm like how about let's work (laughs) oh they drive me bonkers um they and and they're so tone deaf a lot of the time um one that i will give an example that was um you know, I might get in trouble for saying that, but my workplace has those 
adult parenting posters and they had the penny pinching one these things that's my pet peeve <laughs> oh i hadn't thought of that <laughs> yeah oh yeah they said they said yeah cancel your gym membership sure <laughs> right that poster said cancel your gym membership to save money but the month before they told us that we needed to go to the gym <laughs> to take care of ourselves and i was like my brain is yeah. <laughs> it's what do you want more your health That's, or your yeah. money you got to decide now how about leave me alone <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> sorry I'm, i might get in trouble for saying that <laughs> that's all right all right thank you so much florence for joining us today i know we had uh, such thank a you. great discussion it was great to meet you um if people want to learn more about your work and the center where should they look online for more info Yes, they should Google the National Farm Medicine Center, um, because if they Google that, they will find our website and it's through the Marshfield Clinic Research Institute. Um, and then, um, you know, the Children's Center, too, they'll find the information for that center by going through the National Farm Medicine Center. We also have Twitter account, Facebook account, CultivateSafety.org. Um, is the other website that I uh, that we talked about for a few minutes that has a lot of the practical information that are really intended to help uh, parents um, navigating children and work. That's great. Yeah, and we'll and then, definitely be yeah. uh, talking to you about uh, connecting with some of your colleagues as well because it feels like we could we could have a lot lot of lot of good discussions about different topics. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming on, Florence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us on Barnyard Language. If you enjoy the show, we encourage you to support us by becoming a patron. Go to www.patreon.com backslash barnyard language to make a small monthly donation to help cover the costs of making this show. Please rate and review the podcast and follow the show so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as Barnyard Language, and on Twitter, we are Barnyard Pod. If you want to connect with other farming families, you can join our private Barnyard Language Facebook group. We are always in search of guests for the podcast. If you or someone you know would like to chat with us, please get in touch. We are a proud member of the Positively Farming Media Podcast Network.